Welcome to the Beyond the Bucket Show, a podcast centered around optimizing all lives' buckets. We all have buckets we are balancing, coaching, entrepreneurial ventures, family, passion projects, and health. Let's all take this journey together and become bucket fillers. And here's your host, Chris McSwain. Welcome back to Beyond the Buckets, another fantastic episode. I'm really excited to present our guest today, another WCL head coach, uh, and he's been with them for the last six years, but also in the program for over 15 years, uh, 2022 CCS Open Division Champions. Uh, welcome, Joey Curtin. Hey, Coach. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to jump in, but uh, before we start with all the all the stuff about your program, I'd like to know something about you. So we've known each known of each other as we talked about on the pre call um, for as long as we've been coaching in the WCAL. But uh, give me something that even if somebody knows you, might not really know about you. Oh, someone that knows me might not know about me. Yeah. Oh, um, so a fun a fun fact about you yourself. Know, a lot of people know me, but they don't know that you know I've. I don't work at Reardon full time. You know, yep. I uh, I have a career in real estate that I've that I've been doing since I graduated college. So I've been in, involved in one way or another in real estate field um, for eighteen years. So yeah, that's probably something that people don't know. They they often assume that I just oh you you coach at the school, you work at the school, and you're a teacher or something. But but no, that's not the case. For sure. Um, so talk about briefly about that. What what sort of real estate are you into and and how are you yeah. able to accomplish your goals for your personal life and your personal business, as well as intertwine them with your goals for, that you have for the Reardon basketball program? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the days get long, you know, especially during the season. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it, I think it's it's always been something that uh, I always thought about coaching and and a career um at, outside of a school um you know I've, I've, there's always been thoughts of like hey maybe i just go into academia too and make it easy uh my family members are working here already so might be just a simple jump but uh no i this is something that i, I love to do and um um i've had success in the career so i, I i've always just said been a part of me you know since i've been an adult For sure. uh, but yeah it gets it gets it gets long you know especially during the season you're just you're you're breaking down film. You're practice planning. You're practicing. You know you're you're just doing a lot. And um, you know, especially after you start a family, as you know, um, your time is precious, and uh, you don't have a lot of extra free time anymore once uh, once that happens. So, yeah, just just going through that and maturing as a coach and as a family man and and living life and and just trying to be passionate about what I do. For sure. Yeah, um, I can. I can definitely identify with a lot of the things that you talked about because I was in sales. So the first two years that I was at Valley, I still had a sales job and I did that job for almost 10 years and you had some flexibility and freedom as long as you were making your sales and things like that. But you're right. The days get long, uh, especially when you get into the season and when you become a varsity coach uh, like you have. And I did, it was just, it was just a whirlwind. So when there was an opportunity to get on campus, uh, when my wife got a different job, she, she's a nurse at Stanford. She's now in management. So it kind of, at the time, it wasn't really aligning with our financial needs for our family when it was just me as the sole provider. And then when the opportunity came for her to get a job, she started at USF close to you. Um, and then we were able to make it work financially when Valley had a position on campus that was open. So it's, uh, it's difficult and, and, and I can't even imagine all the things that you have to go through during a season when you have both of those things and they're both a real high priority for you, not to mention the family piece that you also touched on. Yeah. I mean, you just have to compartmentalize your time as best as possible. Um, so after the kids are asleep, you know, then I'll throw on the huddle and get to work and, <laughs> um, and and do all that stuff. But yeah, it's it's been it's been interesting because it's something that you've always done. You know, before you were married, before you had kids, before you know, this was something that you were passionate about. You put a lot of time and effort into, um, and then now you're you're just mixing it into your life with other people involved and 
as my kids get older, hopefully they can, you know, be a part of it too. And even if they don't play basketball, just to see a team dynamic, um, what it means to work hard, you know, showing up every day. And uh, I think that's the, the part I'm looking forward to next. For sure. Um, so we were talking a little bit before we jumped on about uh, we both graduated in 2001 and you went to Reardon. I went to Del Mar. We almost had a game against each other in the CCS final, but uh, we blew it in the semifinals versus yeah. one of your arch rivals then and now Sacred Heart Cathedral. Uh, and we, we we were number one in the section. And I think you guys were somewhere in the top five as well. And we were really looking forward to that game. And I just I just told you about the story of your uh, your all star Marquise Caitley dunking over Jason Harrison, one of my good friends who ended up playing football at UCLA. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to play each other. But um, why don't you give a, a, a quick you know, two and a half, three minute backstory on you, where you grew up and kind of your upbringing and that has led you to where you're at right now. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, that's funny. Um, like I said, you know, Marquis dunked on a lot of people, uh, myself included in practice. So I'm not, I'm not shocked at that story. I think I remember the dunk. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, growing up in San Francisco, that's where I grew up. I went to St. Paul's uh, grammar school K through eight and then Reardon and then uh, University of San Francisco. So I went to school in San Francisco my whole life. Uh, and uh, it's just been, it's just been a, my home, you know, and I, I've always been involved in the community in some sort, you know, I was at the park every day at Upper Noe Playground, uh, Day Street Park playing all kinds of sports, football, ba basketball, baseball, tennis, uh, whatever it was, you know, we were, we were out there every day playing and, um, I think my first exposure to coaching was my mom at that part, you know, and, and she was coaching um, St. Paul's volleyball team, which her little cousins were on. So she was an older cousin. She had younger cousins that were going to St. Paul's too. And um, that was my first exposure to coaching and team stuff. And I was along for the ride and, you know, I started noticing, Hey, these games are fun. You know, this is, this is something that I like. And, um, winning was th thrilling and losing sucked and just being a kid soaking it all in you know i didn't even really truly grasp it but you know being around it i think it was just by you know osmosis like i was like okay i like this um and so i as a kid you know just growing up in the city and and playing all these sports park and rec league cyo um you know when i got to Rudin, i was always i was always into sports so it just kind of took hold early Right. And did you play only basketball? Or did you play multiple sports at Reardon? I played baseball and and uh, basketball. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which was your better sport? Oh, basketball. I, I, I gave up baseball. Uh, it was too cold. Yeah, I mean, maybe if yeah. I was if I was somewhere like Valley Christian, I'd like it because, you know, it's nice and toasty <laughs> during baseball season. But here uh, it's just too cold. And I was like, ah, if I really want to make the team and I really love basketball more at that at point in time, uh, I figured I, I might as well just really commit to it and dedicate myself to it. And, and it worked out. For sure. Yeah, I uh, played three sports growing up as well. Football, basketball, baseball. And f basketball was always my first love. I loved it. Um, football, I was pretty naturally good at. But baseball was my best sport growing up. And quite honestly, I probably should have continued to play. But sophomore year, you know how it goes. It's AAU basketball. Um, and then you know, and you have summer football getting ready to start. And so baseball was in between all of that stuff. And so I had to make a, I had to make a choice. It's either AAU basketball and then get ready for football or you play baseball and basically your whole summer is going to be gone. So um, I decided to stick with football and basketball and, and that's kind of uh, what I did. But the same thing with you, I just I started coaching at a young age, you know, when I was in college and playing, I started coaching at one of the middle schools in the off season. And that just kind of sparked my interest to, to get going and the competitiveness and, and all that. Cause I just, I just love to compete. And I, I know that watching you on the sidelines and just seeing you grow as a coach, you're the same way. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, same, uh, same kind of story with me where my brother is seven years younger than me. So when I was in college, um, I started coaching his middle school, you know, when he was in middle school and coaching that team, that CYO mm. team. So that was my first foray into into coaching a, an actual basketball team. 
Sure. Uh, but I always wanted to be a coach, even when I was a player. You know, I was always uh, team captain. I always knew all the plays where everyone should be. And, you know, I just had that that natural, you know, coaching instinct. Um, so, you know, when, when I got to coach my brother's team with Jamal Ball, who's um, assistant coach at San Ignatius, uh, we, we were kind of like the coaches of this little middle school team. And mm. uh, it was fun. It was fun to coach with him. And to coach my brother's team, it was it was cool. And one of the players on that team, my brother's best friend, is my, has been my assistant coach for uh, 13 years. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so it just, it's funny how it all, you know, comes together. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, talk about the relationship piece when it comes to coaching. So many times there's just so many valued relationships that come just because of this sport of basketball. I can think of literally countless uh, over the over the 20 years that I've been coaching now. Um, so tell me about like the relationship piece, because for that to actually happen, for somebody to be with you for that long, they don't they're not even uh, they're not even f friends. They're now brothers in in that respect. And that's something that I've always loved about sports. Yeah, you know, I think it's especially like when you're in a position where you're the head coach now and you have a, you have to build a staff, you have to hire people. Um, I think it's. I think it's about like, okay, how do you treat people? You know, at the end of the day, any, any, any career, it's, it's how do you treat people? Um, do they, do, are you asking them to do something that you, you haven't done or won't, wouldn't be willing to do yourself? Um, and I've always, I've always let my actions speak louder than my words, you know? Um, and I don't want to say something and not back it up. And so, I, you know, even as a young coach, when I, when I had a lot of time and I had all this, um, this freedom and I had, to, I had a chance to make my mark as a coach. Um, it was, I mean, I was in the gym till 11 o'clock at night, just rebounding, shooting with guys and, and getting them, you know, getting their handles, right. Whatever, whatever it was, I picked guys up, take them to the gym. And I did, I started that early. I started that early was, you know, with my middle school guys, you know, when I was, when I was in college still, I'd take them to the gym, we'd shoot 500 shots each, you know, we would just, just saying, hey, this is what I would do. And so now as a, as a coach who's been in the game for a while and I necessarily am not doing that anymore. Sure. Um, but I want I want guys around me that have that hunger too, right? And they have ambitions to be a head coach or to be a trainer or whatever it may be. Um, but those are the guys that I like to surround myself with um, and talented, talented coaches, guys who are doing it for the kids that are really just dedicated. Um, but at the same time, they see me and I'm like, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not taking a day off when I, when I shouldn't be taking a day off, you know, I'm, I'm going all out when I'm here. And so I think they see that and they go, Hey, this guy, is, he's doing what he says he, he, he would do. And he backs it up. That's another reason why I love these conversations with coaches, because the story is, is a little bit different, but the blueprint is still the same. And every one of us started in a similar way where we're trying to get to the gym early. We're trying to work out kids. We're trying to build relationships. We're trying to learn as much as we possibly can as a young coach. And then as you start to do that, you know, your work ethic speaks for itself. And then people start to recognize that, as you mentioned earlier, I like my actions to speak for me. I don't want to have to be, I want to be in the gym. I want to be active and that sort of thing. And you can tell like um, on huddle, for instance, you can, the assistant coaches, if they go on huddle, they can see how much you're watching and vice versa. You can see how much the, co the, the, the other staff is watching. You can see how much your players are watching and that doesn't lie. It's not like, you know, you can't just make that that number up and you just can't make the number of hours that you put up early on in your career. I just think that that is one of the things that I would recommend to all young coaches is like just really learn your craft. And so many people want that escalator up to the to the 10th floor right away. And you and I both know it's a long period of time before you get to where you want to get to. So both you and I coached JV for a lot of years. Um, you were at Reardon and, and me at Del Mar, Lee, uh, Monta Vista. And then I was able to get the job at Valley. But talk about those early days as a head JV coach. What were some of those days like? And how did that help you become, you know, the great varsity coach that you are now? Yeah, I mean, those days were uh, super valuable. Just to ha head coaching, ha have head coaching experience. Uh, you, you can't really re 
replace that. You know, like you can't replicate that. You have to be a head coach to get that head coaching experience. And I don't care if it's freshman B, freshman A, it doesn't matter. Um, I, what, what I learned during those years is that um, you can be creative. You know, you can, uh, hey, you're outmatched. You know, I'm going to try this zone. I'm going to try this jump defense. I'm going to try this this offense that, you know, I've been wanting to run, but maybe people are too scared to deviate from this from the uh, standard. Um, and, I, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to try it all. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to um, – and then, and then it said – and then I told myself, I'm going to treat this junior varsity team like a varsity team. So they have to go to film. They have to go to study hall. They have to go to weights the same way as if they were the varsity team. Mm. Um, and so that put more work on me, but I was like, well, this is what I want to do. And so if I want to do this, uh, I better be ready myself and see what it really takes. So, um, the, it was, it was extremely rewarding. Um, even though I, we didn't have the most talented junior varsity teams, you know, you, a lot of times, you know, as a JV coach, the talented kids go up to varsity and, you know, you're kind of stuck in the middle, you know, the, or they just let them play freshman with their class and, yep. So um, I would always say, like, you know, no one cares about the varsity, junior varsity win-loss record. Um, only people that care are the, the players here and the parents in the stands. But as coaches, we're going to try to make these guys ready for varsity. If they get called up, if they make the team, they're going to be ready to go. And uh, I prided myself on that, and I thought we did a tremendous job, and I thought it was extremely valuable. Talk about the process of going from a junior varsity to a varsity coach um, like six years ago. What was that process like for you? Um, and what advice would you give other people trying to make that jump? Well, I think I was ready. By the time I was done, you know, with that last university season, um, I think the last two, I was like, I could, I could coach in a varsity game and feel extremely confident. Um, and and before you go, tell the people how many years you were coaching at that at that level. So I was for my first three seasons, I was an assistant varsity coach only, and then last seven, I was a JV head coach. Um, so that's how long. I mean, it took you know, it takes a while, but I, I but I I felt confident at that time. Like my last JV season, especially, I thought, um, you know, we lost the game last last game of the league season we lost at midi kid hit a buzzer beater from half court bank three um to send it into overtime and then overtime was back and forth and we lost that game and i still say to this day like that was the most devastating loss i've i've had as a coach at Ridden. i've lost some heartbreakers here you know um and we've had some high stakes games but that one for some reason uh sticks with me because we just that our team wasn't that good but we had a chance to win tie for the league championship as a junior varsity team which which we hadn't done right you know, so in a long long time so i was like you know this is our chance you know and then to, to bank three and all that and but we just coached so hard yeah we coached our butts off that year like we just did everything we could do we we maximized that team completely and so we wanted i wanted to give them something you know, I wanted to say, hey, this is your your medal for winning, you know, junior varsity championship right. because you guys you guys deserve it, man. You know, that's what I wanted for them. Right. Um, so that one that one sticks with me for some reason. I don't know. It's just the one that that gets me. You know, um, the other losses, I just, you know, that's the other thing. You know, it helped me deal with lo losing better in a better way. You know, um, coaching the lower levels because I just. You know, you realize, man, it's about development. Are they getting better? Are they are they learning from this loss? Are we? Am I learning as a coach? Mm. And the biggest thing for me was like, what could I do to get them better? You know, I, a lot of coaches I think fall into the trap of blaming their talent or blaming the players, whatever. Um, and I said to myself, you know, if I ever become a head coach, I'll never do that. Um, and so yeah, that's I, I, I try to try to really stick to that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> when I was a JV coach at uh, Monta Vista High School, we were we won the league that that year. But in a tournament, we were playing a uh, we were playing Saratoga, which was their rival, and 
that was going to be like whoever is going to win the league championship that year. Um, and we, we lost to them at a tournament on a buzzer beater. And I remember driving home and just so much emotion came over me. I just started bawling yeah. on the way home. Like this yeah. would, this had never happened to me um, prior to that. And I just started bawling. Like, I was just like, what could I have done? I, I switched to like a three, two zone and they ended up hitting a three. And I just thought it was all on me. And you just don't have, I don't think you have the intellect at that point in time. at such a young age, like to, to like sift through, okay. The guy made a lucky shot. It wasn't your fault completely. Could you have did something differently potentially, but the guy made a lucky shot. And a lot of that stuff is out of your control. And as you get older, you know, hopefully you can manage those losses a lot better. I know when I had children, it's put a lot of things in perspective because they really it, like, it doesn't matter. Like mm -hmm. it does matter in the grand scheme of things, as far as like what you internalize and, and what you want for your program and stuff like that. But the wins and losses really don't matter. It really comes down to, did I impact this, this young person's life in a way that's going to benefit them long-term? Have we taught them some habits in this program that's going to translate to them being a exceptional father or mother, a, 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 a parent, um, you know, uh, somebody in the workforce or somebody that is in leadership. That is what it really comes down to for me and, I know these, these, these wins and loss, the wins feel great. And it's like, there's no other drug like coaching, right? Yeah. Cause you can lose one of those tough games and then you come back and you, and you win by two. And it's just like, Oh, I got another rush. Like it's just, uh, it's just an amazing, amazing feeling. And nobody can really understand it until they're in it. Yeah, no doubt. And I, you know, I, I mean, I used to hate losing. I mean, I would cry if we lost a game as a kid, you know, and yeah. Um, and it didn't matter if it was Monopoly or chess or basketball, you know, I just video game didn't matter. Uh, I, I just hated losing. Um, but, you know, as the, as uh, I, I, yeah, having children definitely grounds you, uh, puts things in perspective. Uh, but I also, I think, you know, yeah, it's, like you said, I mean, it sounds strange, but it doesn't matter. You know, what, what matters is, you know, do, the, do these kids respect you as a mentor, as a coach? Mm. You know, some of these kids look at you as a father figure. Sure. You know, that is so much more powerful. <sighs> um, and being at a place like Reardon, you know, that stuff I think is maybe a little more up, up at the forefront than, than other schools maybe in our league. Sure. Um, where that stuff is more important. And I think um, I, I always say, guys, we're going to work our tail off. We're going to be, we're going to have, talented kids we're going to work um we won't be outworked i promise you that now there may be a team that hits a few more shots that day uh, maybe my game plan isn't on point uh, maybe they throw something at us that hey we weren't prepared enough for uh, but we'll bounce back and but but what matters is like we did everything we could do in our power and if we didn't and if it didn't get the job done then we'll adjust and we'll do it again the next day for sure. Um, and I think that getting back up and just saying, hey, it is what it is. I'm, I'm, I might take an L, but I'm not taking, I'm not, I'm not going to be in this mode where I'm like, okay, that's all I do. We're going to bounce back. It's okay. It's life. You know, it happens. Yep. One of my favorite quotes is by Cara Lawson. She's a Duke women's basketball head coach. And she talks about preparation being, uh, preparation doesn't guarantee the outcome. Right. It only guarantees growth. And that is exactly what you were talking about there and something that we try to embody in our program too and and say hey look somebody guess what they're just going to be better and i, was, I did a, a solo podcast a few weeks ago like if i was to do play steph curry in a shooting competition like i think i could shoot pretty well but i could take a whole year and shoot every single day for the for three hours a day four hours a day you pick them you pick the number i still probably not going to be able to beat him like yeah. And, and that's just, and that's okay, but I would be a really good shooter if I spent three hours a day shooting the basketball. I would be a really really good shooter, and it's only it, it didn't it didn't get the outcome of beating Steph, but it was the outcome of 
growing and I became better and I'm better than probably most people because I put that time, energy and effort in. That's the same thing when it comes to basketball. Some, you're just going to come up against somebody maybe bigger and stronger or better, or they make a few shots. And at the end of the day, does that change our growth? Does that change what we've accomplished in that season? Does that change that kid hitting that bank shot? Doesn't change what you got, what you instilled in those kids. And yes, it sucks in the moment. It really, really does suck because we're all competitors and we want to win. But at the end of the day, those kids know how much they put into it. They know how much you put into it. And hopefully that is extremely rewarding when they think back upon that experience during their JV time uh, with you as the head coach. Yeah. And I think that, that did happen. You know, they, I st they still, talk, I, and I was lucky enough to be able to coach those kids a little bit more now. Right. So mm. that was my last year as a varsity coach. I got, I got them as varsity players, you know, a lot of them. So that was cool. You know, that was cool to be able to coach them a couple more seasons Definitely. Um, and really build that bond up. And uh, they still talk about that JV year, you know, like <laughs> it was a fun year for them. It was, it was awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, so tell me about the transition from JV to varsity. What was some of the things that you wanted to do? Uh, the Reardon program is enriched with so much, so many, so many success stories, so many championships, so many great players to come out of Reardon. Um, and what did you want to do and how did you try to put your stamp on it? I, I really enjoyed talking to Colin and Alex talking about how they put their, their own stamp, even though the schools that they're respectively at have, have different traditions and things like that, but you're you. And so you don't want to do everything that the previous coach did, but you also want to respect the fact that a lot of people came before you. So what was your process like when, uh, when you took over as a head? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I, my, my whole thing was, um, you know, I had a list of like things I wanted to do if I ever became the head coach at Ritten. And you know what, to be honest, if I didn't get the job here, I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't be, I probably wouldn't be coaching high school basketball. You know, I, I might've went just the club route and done that and, and been fine and, and had my, you know, my coaching cup filled that way, you know, and that competitive itch, um, taken care of that way. But at Ridden, that's the only, this is the only place that I would, I would commit this much time and effort and, and everything to, because to me, it's, it's my home. You know, I was a player here. I was a student here it's it's um it's a special place and i want it to be special so um when i took over the program uh we were one in 13 in league you yeah. know the first the first year um i mean the year before i took over we were one in 13. so i you know i had a list i said okay when we play we're gonna we're gonna play a certain style you know that was important to me um we were gonna coach a certain way that we had been building up at, at the JV level, like, hey, this is how I want my players to feel when they're at practice, right? Um, and so, I, you know, I think when Alex got the job at Bellarmine, you know, we had played them at Stanford, um, and I think it was his first summer tournament. Yeah, and, he um, had to play you like two days after he got the job. Yeah, so. and he and and like we're like sitting there chatting, and you know, and he's like, hey, you know, how long? You know, he asked me like, how long did it take you to like make the program yours? You know, like. To, to, to put your imprint on it. Sure. And I told him, I said, one year. I said, you'll do it your first year, Alex, because you know what to do. You know, you've been there. You know you know these kids. Uh, you've seen the league. You know the wins and the losses, man. Like, you, you'll do it your first year. And he was like, okay. Uh, I said, all right, I'll, you know, well, I guess it's year one. I said, yeah, you'll do it right away. Um, and I noticed it right away. I noticed yeah. it. I noticed it our first scrimmage, you know, and I was like, okay, this is going to be good. You know, yeah, we, we probably have the least amount of talent in the league, but it's, this is going to be a fun year. It's going to be a fun team to coach. And so we did that. I think we set the record for most, one of the things we wanted to do is shoot the three, um, we hadn't been a good shooting team for a long time. We had athletes, but we, we just never shot the three well. Even when I think maybe Marquise was there, it was probably the last year we were like decent at three, and that was a different era, right? So when I come in, the high school wasn't really shooting threes as much yet. You know, right. the, remember, think about this, seven, 2017. Yep. 
know, Steph kind of broke out 15, 16. So this was just, you know, the revolution was just kind of starting, but it didn't hadn't hit the WCAL, very traditional old school league. Sure. With a lot of coaches that have been around for a while. Um, so I was like, well, we're going to shoot the three. Um, and I think we set the school record for three pointers made in the season the first year. Yeah. We, wow, that's that's something we have in common. My 2016 team owns the number uh, single game and league made threes uh, for the WCAL. There you go. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, so we that's that was a big for me, you know, like and and it wasn't just because oh the, you know it was hey let's let's try to modernize this, you sure. know let's try to let's try to get let's try to play let's try to play a certain style that's fun for players to play and that makes sense analytically sure you know we're outmatched what's the what's the biggest way to you know equalize this game it's the that three-point line right um and i see teams try to do it to us now so you know i'm on the flip side of it now you know i'm the you know we're the we're the big bad team and the, these other guys are like well we better hit some threes today For you know sure. Well, it's oh. a great equalizer, like you said. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the league has well it, traditionally it was like coaches have been there forever, and now I feel like the league has really changed um, on the girls. Side. Well, first of all, when I got in, I was the youngest coach, and now I'm the second oldest. <laughs> Which is crazy to which is crazy to think of. Sue, obviously, um, she's been there for thirty three years now, I believe. So uh, I'm not I'm not beating that anytime soon. But for, for you guys, obviously, Chuck Rap is the, the the oldest and been there the longest. But Tim TK is pr- relatively young. Um, you, Alex, uh, Faf are all kind of in the same demographic. Si, same type of deal. Um, uh, Sacred Heart, same deal. So the the league used to be like old as far as like how long the coaches have been there yeah. and uh, their age, and now it's turned kind of like the new the new young generation of coaches in their late thirties and early forties. Uh, talk about how cool that is when it comes to you know just our league. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm the third longest tenured coach now. You know, it's Chuck and Tim, and then me. So unreal. Yeah. it's unreal. Uh, it's just, yeah. And I was the youngest, you know, when I came in. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, I think it's cool. I think it's good for the league. Um, it's a big league, you know, it's a league rooted in tradition, you know, because all sports are, you know, competitive. Everybody wants to win uh, best league in Northern California and, you know, sports wise. Um, and so, you know, to have some new blood, uh, changing styles a bit, you know, I think, I think what's important in this league, especially is finding the coach that works right for that school community and that, you know, environment True. that matching that match, I think is the most important thing. You know, everybody's a great, I mean, they're all really great coaches. I, you know, I respect, I respect them all. Um, they do a tremendous job. And, but I think the league does a really good job at like matching the right coach for the community, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, and so, that's kind of what makes it special to me. Like, Hey, they've got some new blood, but they've, they've done a good job matching it up and, and getting good coaches for that school. Right. Um, so talk about your first few years and you've gotten to a point now where you're one of the perennial like top programs in, in, in Northern California, always competing at the highest level of NorCal and things like that. So how were you able to scale this so quickly coming from a, 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 a season where they didn't win too many wins in league and now you're at top of the league, you've won a CI, CCS open division, you're in the running every single year. Um, so talk about how you were able to scale so quickly and so fast. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, part of it is, um, I think part of it was just like having the, having the goal, like, and setting the standard, you know, um, since the first year, I mean, after the first year, we've won 10 league wins. We've had at least 10 league wins every year. We've either come in first or second in league every year. Yep. Um, so to be able to do that, and I think that's just, and we've had two WCL championships um, in the last since 2020. 
um, and a CCS Open one in there too. And we've had two WCL championships in, you know, 20 years before that. Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. Hard so, to do. I think that's, I think, I think people I lose sight of how hard that is. I mean, it's I, like, it's draining. I, I, after the CCS Open Championship um, in 2022, um, we had to go to Santa Cruz for that. And we're on the bus ride back and I li I was just drained. Mm -hmm. Like I was done. Like everyone's celebrating in the bus, like having a good old time. And I'm at the front seat by the bus driver and I'm just like slumped, you know, because that's how much it just took out of me. And sure. um, it's, it's, uh, it's so hard. And I think people don't realize that. But it did scale up fast, and I think part of it is so. So, once you double click on that, what is the hard part about it for people that may not be in it, like uh, uh, like we know? It because every team in our league is so they all have competitive players. They're all they all have talent. They all have good coaching. They have good structure. They have communities that support them. Uh, you're not gonna get an easy night. It's just it doesn't exist. And so other leagues, you might have two or three really good teams. Right. But hey, we know, hey, this week we got two games that we can play everybody and rest, you know, like it, it doesn't happen in the WCL. It just doesn't happen. Even when you think a team is not good, that team ends up winning CCS D2 or do you know, or like they beat a team in CCS Open uh, one or two seed and you're like, where did this come from? They had a losing record. Yeah. You know, but it's the way the league is, you know? No, and no. Um, so I think that's the hard part. I think that and, you know, uh, also I think people don't realize how hard it is coaching talent. Mm. They think coaching talent is easy. And unless you're a coach and unless you've done that, you understand that actually it's harder to coach talent. It's easier to coach, hey, I got one player. These four guys play a role. The bench guys know their bench got. That's the easy team to coach. You know, you might not win as many games. Sure. You might not win as many games, but that that's an easy you the hierarchy is built in. But when you're coaching like talent, everybody wants to play division 1 college basketball or division 2 or division that's the hard part. You know, that's the part where you're you're managing more than just X's and O's. And how have you been able to do that? Obviously, you've done a good job at, you know, cultivating that talent and putting it in a team system. So what are some of the tricks that you would have? This is a selfish question, too, because when I got yeah. teams like that, it, it, those have been some of my most difficult years. Where, yeah, we have, where we have that team and yeah. it's like, oh, OK. And then. Yeah, and you win a you won a lot of games, but it's it's whew, man. I, mm -hmm. I agree I agree with that statement. So I want to know how you've been able to do it. Um because when we get those when we have those teams, I want you know some other other you know items to the ingredients to put into this recipe to make sure that it comes out the way we want it. So I think when you what the biggest thing that I've learned, and this was like a, this was a learning experience for me at the varsity level, like okay, I had I had to learn this quickly and uh, you know sometimes the hard way sometimes I, I figured it out on my own but um, I think you have to coach each player you coach them as people you know you talk to them I, I try to talk to every one of my players every practice and I and I and I don't even say like instruct them yeah we're instructing them but just talking to them sure you know like hey you know did you get that science project done? You know, like I know it was, oh yeah, I did. You know, just that, like, and that guy's the 12th guy on the team. Yeah. You know, so I think what happens is, and I, and I've experienced this is where you're, you're maybe you're the 10th guy, 11th guy, 12th guy. Your head coach might not talk to you for a week. Mm -hmm. You know, you may say, you know, you may be running the play, doing the drill, all that stuff, but has he talked to you? Has he really talked to you? Um, has he coached you? Like, has he done a one-on-one? -on -one, you know, so I've, I've always been like, hey, I'm going to coach everybody every day. And so I have my assistants doing everything, but I'm, I'm, I'm hitting everybody. And I think when you do that, they know that the coach, you know, it's because you care about them. You know, you, you understand they're not playing right now, but hey, 
we faced a situation last season where we we're playing guys in a NorCal Division One semifinal, and these guys hadn't played in a month, maybe you know, barely. But I needed them that night, and so mm. they were ready to play for me, you know. Right. And so I think that's big, and and I think keeping keeping the game fun. Um, I think that's huge because look, any team you're on, if you're whether you're good or not. You can have a, a successful team that's winning 20 games and have a team that's winning 10 or 12. Somebody's not playing a lot. It doesn't matter if you're good or not. For sure. It's just so the, how, how, yeah, it's just we got, we got 160 minutes in the in a yeah, game. Yeah, somebody's not playing a lot. So you so you might as well have a team that's super talented and winning games and dealing with that. And that's harder because now that guy that is not playing but could be playing because he's a good player too. But the other players in front of him are just a little bit better. Yeah. But if you have that guy ready and you keep you keep it fun for him and you you make it clear that everybody has a role on the team and his role is just as important as the star player. It really is. For sure. Because you could have three of those guys that don't play and they're bad at their role. They're bad teammates. They don't cheer. They don't bring the energy at practice every day. They don't know. And it's going to take away from the team. For sure. What's your what's your practice style? Do you have your assistants run a lot of this stuff, or are you the main voice? Um, do you kind of change and switch throughout that uh, whatever whatever you're doing? Um, how does that how does your practice work? Uh, yeah, I'm the main voice. I mean, I've I've got I've gone to uh, college practices where the head coach I, I, he might not might may not speak during the whole practice, <laughs> and I said, all right, I can't afford, it. I can't do that. Um, and the reason I'm, the reason I say that is just not that I don't trust my coaches or not that they're not that they're not excellent coaches. It's just that um, I'm always like, hey, I'm I'm going to get blamed. Right. Like if something goes wrong. So I want to make sure that I'm doing everything in my power to make this run smoothly, be successful. Um, and so I don't want to put that burden on anybody else. Sure. Now I've learned to say, Hey, you know, you're going to, you're really good at this. Why don't you take this? Right. So second half of practice after our water break, you start off and do this and they kind of know what I want now. You know, I think we've had some continuity. Um, we have a good relationship. All of our, all of our coaches are, are tremendous. Um, and they get after it with the guys, you know, they're in the, they're in the drills. They're, they're hitting guys with the, with the pad. They're, you know, taking charges, set an example. They're doing it all. So, um, I think I've learned to, to delegate a little bit, a bit more in recent years. The delegation is key. I think for me, what I've done is I used to try to do everything. Like you said, it's all going to be on you. So if it's, if it's all good or it's all bad, it's going to come, come back to you anyway. Right. So yeah. what I've done now and just whether it be going to watch other practices or see things and I'll go watch other sports. I watch our baseball team practice a lot. Um, the way that he does things and how he does it, it's more of like a football or basketball practice. It is so, um, and then I got this from a football practice as well. Um, uh, Chip Kelly, he's at UCLA now, but uh, when he was up in Oregon and Philadelphia, he has these chip drills. So like to start practice, we do these one or two minute drills just to get it going. And it's always fast. We don't get water breaks anymore either. You can get water anytime you want it, but we're not going to stop if we have a two hour practice and we have this a lot of time for, for practice. 120 minutes. Well, if I, if I put four water bricks in there, well, you know, even if it's three minutes, it's going to turn to five. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to waste, you know, 15 minutes of my practice on that, but you can get it anytime you want. Cause there's a lot of, there's time where you're not in, so you can just get it. And so we just put it on the baseline, just stuff like that. And then my, I, I've given my assistants their roles. Like I used to run the offense and defense and now I just run the defense. Okay. I know my I know my offensive philosophy, and so I've talked to my assistant coach. He's in charge of running that. These are this is what I want to see. I need, we need to get this kid shots. This is how we're going to be able to do it. So delegation has been very very key. And early on, you would just do everything, but I don't want my assistants to come there and just stand there and be assistants. I see this all the time. You know, you go to a tournament, and the assistant coaches have are, are just literally cheerleaders. 
no, I want you actually involved with this. You know, I want you calling the plays. I don't call any of the plays, which is hard for me because I was an offensive guy my whole life. And now I'm, I've given up that responsibility. That's because I trust him so much and how he, how he presents it. I can fall back and then I can focus on other stuff. Now I can focus on the relational piece, like you mentioned, which is so, so valuable and important. So I think uh, for any coach out there, I think the delegation of your responsibilities is really going to make you more optimal as a head coach. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, and it comes with trust, right? It comes with trust. It comes with experience. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, what we do is, is preference, right? You know, we can win a lot of different ways. You know, we can win playing zone. We can win pressing. We can win, you know, running this type of offense. Um, but it's what, what do I want it to look like? What do I believe in? And then, everybody hey let's get together and let's execute this vision for sure um what did so how the biggest thing that i've talked to a lot of coaches about is like uh dealing with parents and how you do that is 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 very difficult um so many parents are putting resources towards their child's education as well as their athletics, hoping that they're going to get a scholarship when there's a limited number of scholarships available. Uh, and the likelihood of them attaining one is very low unless you have very high skill and great athleticism and size or a combination of all three of those things. So how do you deal with parents and what is your approach when it comes to having those difficult, tough conversations with the people that you need to be in relationship with because you're coaching their kid? Yeah, I think the good thing about um, us having guys that have played at the next level over the past several years um, is you have examples to point to. You know, you said, you know, if the parent has this um, – expectation of their child and, and all that, you know, I always try to say, you know, like we, uh, a, a player for my 2020 team, um, he had, he went Juco, Dominic Wilson, great kid, great player, helped us win a lot of games, um, just got a full scholarship and I, NAIA, um, you know, very proud of him. And he, he'll, he'll be going up there pretty soon here to get training and going with them. Um, but what's nice about that is, Hey, this, this guy went the Juco route he's getting his college education paid for and he gets to play basketball. Right. You know, and are you bigger, better, harder working and get as good as grades as Don Wilson? <laughs> so if you're not, you know, don't expect that. Right. <clears throat> right. And, and it goes down the like now it's down the line. Okay. You want to be D one player. Okay. Are you bigger, better, faster, harder working and more, coachable than so-and-so yep so that's what's great like when you have these great examples and and these guys have accomplished great things you have you can tell the parent i had a player who was same size as your son same skill level did this this and that this is a this is probably a, a, a realistic trajectory for him right yeah. and the goal at, at the end of the day is to continue your education what what is the whole goal for you you think he's going to be a pro and on the flip side of it is like, there's guys that have a chance to be a pro. So you you tell them that too. Now, we're not just telling kids, oh, you have no chance. We're telling kids, no, you do have a chance. Right. Or this is your chance. This is your path. And these are all good paths. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, your education is going to be paid for. You're ahead of the game. I try to break, I try to go big, big picture to that. I want to say how many how many people that go to college have student loan debt this in this era? A ton. A ton. And, and then just, I want and then yeah. I go bring it down even more. I go now. How many are male? 60, 60 There are two thirds of the uh, of the population in college now are female, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so now your son is going to college and he's getting a degree for free. He's ahead of the game. He's ahead of the ninety nine percent of people. Yep. So that's how I try to present it because it's true. And it should, it, sh it should not, you should not be worried about the level. It, you should no. be, you should be focused on, okay, I want my kid or the kid. I want to play college basketball. That is the goal. It doesn't really matter what the level is because you can go to a high level school and not, and not touch the floor. You can go to a school that is a smaller school and play a lot. 
Which one would you prefer? Everybody wants to play. And, and they're, I don't both just wanna, exactly. they're both free. And they're both good schools. Think yeah. about that. You know, we had a player um, who was from South Sudan, and he was such a great student, great, great presence at school. The teachers loved him. Excellent human being. And this is someone from South Sudan, which is one of the poorest countries, war-torn countries in the world. Wow. And he's coming to Reardon, and he doesn't really know how to play basketball. He's never been coached. They don't have teams. You know, they don't have <laughs> – you know, he's, he's learning the game, and he's in a foreign country, and he's doing it for his family. And guess what? He gets to play Division three basketball, and he doesn't pay to play. You know, he's, he's at a great school, and I looked it up, and it's the third most expensive school in the nation. <laughs> So, um, so this, you know, those are the those are the great examples of what we can do here in our school in our basketball program for kids, you know, that become young men and now are launching their their adulthood like ahead of the game, right? And in his case, I mean, now he gets to help out his family, no doubt. I mean, that's beautiful yeah. to me. And that's, and I'm stealing this from Colin because. He 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 talked about this when we when we when we sat down last a few weeks ago, but think about it like this: in all areas of our life, we look at analytics, we look at numbers, but when you look at high school basketball and the number of players that really have the opportunity to go play at the next level, it is a minuscule number. And so we're trying to first of all, I don't know anybody that's won the lottery. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people that play. And there's only a few, very few select few, few people that win. And some people win the scratchers and stuff like that. I only say that because my mom buys scratchers. And I'm like, mom, you're wasting your money. Well, I won $50 this time. <laughs> okay, yeah, you won $50 this time. But how many times did it take you to actually get that? And then you go ahead and, and just basically reinvest your reinvest the money that you, that you got. Anyway, Colin talked about how it is it, we look at numbers in every other – every other venue and we ignore them when it comes to this basketball understanding that there are limited spots. Um, the transfer portal is changed things. COVID has changed things, getting extra years, all that sort of stuff. So it's just wild that we don't look at it that way. And I think people should start to look at it more as an analytic rather than just something that, Oh, I think I can do this because my kid is this. And, you know, when you have real life examples, I think it helps. No you know, doubt. I think it helps. I think, you know, when you sent kids D1 out of your program, you know what a D1 player is. For sure. And uh, same with, and we, and the one thing I looked up the other day is uh, on my 2020 roster, not just the seniors, but everybody on that roster has played college basketball at some level. Everybody wow. on the team. So that tells me that the the love of the game wasn't taken away from them coaches can do that to players you know For sure. it's, it's very it's a very sensitive thing you always have to be cognizant of that as a coach i i've always felt you want it to be fun it's a game they can only you're only playing this for so long you know you, of course you're working hard everybody's working but you have to you have to think about like don't zap the joy from them it's going to get zapped eventually you don't you, i don't want to be the person that does it no, I agree. Right. I agree. So, um, so everybody play is either playing from that team is playing pro D one D two D three NAIA or JUCO. Beautiful. I mean, I to me that was like okay, that's a win. That, that that's a win. That's a big time win. And you didn't win in twenty twenty. Obviously, it was different because uh, of COVID and whatnot. Um, but that is a win, and there's a score of the game. And there's a score of the game of life and the score of the game of life is off the charts when it comes to that. If all those kids, they came there to play basketball and their only objective was to get into an opportunity to continue that. Well, that's a win. Yeah. That is a huge win. Um, and doing my research for, for, for today, I noticed that your whole family works at Reardon as well. Your brother and your sister uh, are on the, um, uh, in, in the Reardon family. So talk about how that is 
I believe your sister works in athletics and is the volleyball coach. And then your brother, I think, works in the admissions office or something like that. So talk about that. That's got to be pretty cool for you to have, you know, all your younger siblings around, um, you know, just living the whole reared in life. Yeah, it is cool. My, my sister joined. Uh, she was at SI for 10 years, 11 years, um, but she joined up this past year um, as the volleyball coach and the dean. And my brother's been in the admissions office for several years now. So, I mean, we've had, um, we've had a written, we've had a curtain at, at written for a while, you know, and my wow. dad, my dad's coached football, various roles. Um, so my mom is the only one that hasn't, hasn't coached here yet in some capacity. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure you might put, <laughs> sure, sure you might put uh, her to work. <laughs> uh, don't worry. She coaches me from the stands, you know, uh, okay. she's seen all the games. So she's, you know, she's, She's a sports nut too, you know, so just like our whole family. So it's, it's fun. For sure. So what's next for the Reardon program? What, you know, what are you looking to do over the next several years and, and how do you plan to stay where you're at as well as like increase, you know, getting to that, that open state uh, type of level team, um, things like that. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, and I think this season we have a shot at that, you know, um, but just to stay in that conversation, you know, I think the last four years we've been ranked top 20 in the state, you know, max preps and just being in that conversation and, and being up there and having a, having a reputation as a, a really top notch program is what we strive for, you know, and some, some years are going to be better than others, you know, you know, so I think this year is one of those years where, Hey, you're going to, we got to go for it. You know, we have a talented roster, deep roster, um, Guys are really, really coachable, hardworking. Um, you know, it's a coach's dream. You know, everybody, co every coach that is that's competitive at this level uh, wishes for a team like this. And so, you know, I don't take it like to take it for granted. I don't take take my role lightly. Um, and to be able to like pr like present this to uh, the school and like, hey, this is this is fun. I want it to be fun for everybody. You know, I want I want the stands filled. Um, I want the band rocking. I want everybody to enjoy their time when they're watching the team play. The team's playing hard. They're playing together, and and it's a fun product. And, and so you have this really talented team coming back this year. What is going to be the process? Obviously, you have the summer, and you're going to Section 7. Um, but what does, like, the preseason look like? What are you guys going to be doing to prepare yourselves strength-wise, condition-wise, open gyms? Like, so what's, the, yeah, we've been in the weight the room. Plan? Yeah. They've been in the weight room, uh, three days a week. Um, you know, they're, these guys are really, I mean, I wish I had their work ethic when I was their age. I mean, these guys are just workaholics. Um, we almost have to tell them to, to slow down, you know, <laughs> they're working so much, you know, they're working on their game. Um, you know, we had a 3.25 GPA as a team this year. We've had four guys with 4.0. It was like, you know, these, these kids are just excelling on and off the floor and um, the whole off season, they're just work. They're here to work and we're just, they're, they're having fun with, you know, they're, they're having fun with each other. Um, great vibes on the team so far this summer, you know, we've played in a few tournaments and the big one, like you mentioned, section seven is coming up this week. Um, and so we're in a very competitive bracket. Um, we'll see how we do there. It's always fun. I, I, I like, I love it because that's, that's a huge stage. You got 500 college coaches there. Um, there may be a hundred sitting at, at that first game. Um, and so you, you just want to perform and you want them to, to show out and take care and uh, take advantage of the opportunity because, Hey man, you, you go out there and you ball out, you know, scholarship offers, maybe, maybe, uh, coming your way. For sure. And especially because they get to see them play with our high school team. It's a lot different than the, yeah. cl the club scene. Um, obviously, I'm in the club space and there's some there's some good parts about it. There's some bad parts about it. But what's your you know high level overview of the club scene and and how that all plays in high school basketball and whatnot? I mean, that, that can be a whole podcast in itself. But mm -hmm. as we're winding down, I want to make sure that we at least touch on that because I think it's a, a it's an integral part of high school basketball now. It's just, it's just so, so different from even when when we first started our club in 2010 to even when I played 
AAU. Uh, it's just just really, really different. So talk to me about your experience with club basketball. Yeah, I mean, I think um... – I mean, I think it's important. I think what they've done, kind of organizing it into live periods, these big exposure events, um, it's, it's really helpful for the players that get to play on those circuit teams and get looks. Um, I think that's been organized a bit more, so I think that's great. Yep. Um, and then, you know, making sure that they provide the live periods for the high school teams, I think that's huge because not everybody plays on a circuit team. Um, and then I think it's huge that they have like these NCAA academies now. Uh, they just brought it back. Uh, I, Jelani Clark was one of my players that really benefited from that when he went to that in 2020. I'm sorry, in 2019, before his senior year. Um, I thought that was great that the NCAA did. Um, so I think that whole like club stuff should be for those things. Now, we can. there's a whole podcast about the younger levels and all that stuff. Right. Um, but I think kids play too many games. I think um, more emphasis should be made on playing other sports, cross training, um, and then, you know, actual skill work, body work, so you don't get hurt. Uh, too many kids are getting hurt, in my opinion, from overuse. Right. Yep. Um, and it sucks because when you're a varsity head coach, you're getting kids that more likely than not are specialized, uh, you know? Um, so I try to be like, hey, you're not playing today. You know, this is a mean, meaningless game. You right. don't need to play. Um, sit your butt down and learn, you know, be my assistant coach for the night. Um, but I think, yeah, I think players just play too many games now. And it's, it is what it is. You, I mean, the club teams, like, they provide something for parents to keep their kids in competitive sports, keep them with a the team, keep them social. You know, I, I think that part's great. I just think I wish they played more sports. Right. No, that's why I like, I mean, <clears throat> I just think that once they get to high school, the club scene really, really changes. That's why I really like our younger programs, particularly fourth through eighth grade, because it has nothing to do with any of that. And yeah. I think that's our purest form. Mm -hmm. We're able to keep all the kids together and and you really have the most success and the best relationships. Yes. When you get to high school now, there's so much pressure to be on one of these quote unquote circuit teams that a lot of parents don't really understand the difference between an actual circuit team and a team that is associated with the circuit. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about like, like, you know, you're playing in Peach Jam. You know, or you're playing like like yeah. the real the real top level stuff. I think they do that well for them. You that know? exactly. It's just, it's just the everything under that in that range you're talking about. I don't know, man. I, I yeah. feel like there's other there's other ways to get the most out of you know your time and and have your son or daughter enjoy themselves a little bit more as a, as a kid. One hundred percent agree. I think those programs that are in in the Nike, Adidas, or Under Armour, or some of the now independent circuits, they are marketing to these players that have no real chance to play on those teams. And that is my biggest thing with, you know, programs. Just say it what it is. This is a team that is associated with them, but they're not going to be playing on that. But they yeah. give this some sort of false sense of hope that that is actually going to happen. But, you know, again, we could talk about that forever. Uh, Anyway, this has been a real blast. Like I said, we've known each known of each other for a long time um, and seen each other, but you know, just getting a little bit of insight to who you are and how you run your program. Um, I have nothing but the utmost respect for you. You've done a fantastic job in the well, some people they say it's a short period of time at six years, but you had 10 more years prior to that leading up to that. Same thing with Alex. He was there for 10 years before he got the head opportunity. And so it's a long game. And anybody looking to get into this profession, you're not just going to pop in and be there. And the people that have popped in, they have popped out too quickly, um, as, as, as you know, uh, in, our, in our field. But uh, one last question I have for you. Who should be on the show? And before you before you answer, you have to make the connection because this is the only way I'm able to get guests. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, so you've had 
you've you've been knocking off the WCL coaches, right? Yep, um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost all the way through. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a coach. It's been in that since I brought it back. It's been mostly coaches, but it could be really anybody that has something to say about something. I think we can learn from from anybody that is doing high level things in in their profession. All right, um, I'll 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 get back to you. If I had on the on the on the other side, if I if if you haven't got them scheduled yet, you know I try to get one of my fellow city coaches on there, Caesar Smith or Jason Greenfield. But would love to um, have them on. Yeah, and I'll and I'll get that to you too, so you can. Okay, cool. Uh, pump anything you got. Um, uh, where can everybody either reach out to you if there's coaches or people that want to know about your stop by a practice or you know the reardon instagram which will be popping yeah. this weekend i can't wait to see all the oh yeah, yeah i mean go to reardon basketball on ig um arhs basketball on twitter um yeah it should be some nice updates we have our our media guys going you know that's important nowadays um so we'll have a lot of uh, uh social media presence this week coming up that's good. Well, thank you, Joey. I really appreciate you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to chatting with you again. All right. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time, take care.